All right. Hey. <laughs> All right. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to, and by the way, that's in several other hymns uh, where instead of singing I, I, you sing A. <laughs> We're over in the book of Revelation. We're looking at the church of Sardis, which is church number five, part number two. And we're in Revelation chapter 3, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Five things he tells them to do. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Unto the churches. Gracious Father, we pray that you will cause us to have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to this church, that we might not be dead like Sardis, having a name that we live, but being dead. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the going forth of your word tonight. Again, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, after extended discussion over many weeks, we've tried to wrap up the first four churches into a nutshell, the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. And we saw that nothing has really changed today. And the bottom line, really, in all of those churches is still the same, but now it's called Christian liberty with a twist that permits immorality. At Pergamos, Satan crushed the church with what the church leadership thought would make the church thrive and grow assimilating the culture and having a loose view of so-called Christian liberty. But it was not true Christian liberty, it was only a counterfeit. We noted, and I hope you memorize this definition, that Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do, it is the power to do what you ought to do. Whenever you get in an argument with somebody over so-called Christian liberty, and they'll say, but I have Christian liberty to do this, Remind them, Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do, because that's the manifestation of the flesh. Christian liberty is the power given to you by the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is the power to do what you ought to do. That is, that which is righteous and morally well-pleasing in the sight of God. Very important definition to remember. A loose view of Christian liberty will always end in doctrinal compromise. It will end in the lowering of moral standards. It will end in a hazy sense of fitting in with the culture, and ultimately it will end in judgment by God and the death of a church. Beware when somebody tells you that you must make the church relevant to the culture if you want to grow, because God didn't tell us to make the church relevant according to the standards of the world. He called us to call sinners to repentance. That is what is truly relevant to the church. We saw the connection between Pergamos and Thyatira. Jesus reminded Pergamos that the final authority is the word of God, not their feel-good theology, that in that case ended in gross sexual immorality. Both Pergamos and Thyatira had a few good things that were said about them. We saw Pergamos had four good things said about them. Thyatira, which was even worse, had ten good things said about them, but they also had Jezebel, and they didn't do anything about it. They were both very active churches, Thyatira especially, the one that had ten good things said about it. 
Three times their good works are mentioned and they are praised. But doing good works for Christ is not enough without moral purity, just like having sound doctrine to Ephesus was not enough if you don't have love for Christ. We contrasted the two sins between Pergamos and Thyatira. The primary sin of Pergamos appeared to be worldliness. The primary sin of Thyatira appeared to be the cultural accommodation and compromise. We saw that Revelation 2, 14 and 15 gave us the transition from Pergamos to Thyatira, which included two things, the fornication plot of Balaam and the thing sacrificed to idol, both of which were mentioned at Thyatira. We talked about the antinomians who accuse thoughtful Christians of being legalists because they try to hold the line on moral purity and separation. And that the American church today, even evangelical circles, is primarily antinomian. That means to be against the law. They're, they're opposed to absolute standards. They want flexible standards, even in the so-called evangelical church. If you hold to absolute standards, they'll call you a legalist. I summarized for you the four types of biblical legalism. And by the way, having clear moral standards is not legalism. I also summarized for you the four categories of carnal arguments used by Christians who want to excuse their sins, which helped us to understand the four churches, the first four churches in Revelation. We studied the injunctions in Romans 2, 3, and 6 to demonstrate the true Christian position on how to handle sin in our lives and not be legalists. We talked about Paul discussing those two things that we see at Pergamos and Thyatira, adultery and, and idols, in Romans 2.22, and suggested that Jezebel had probably heard Paul's teaching and John's teaching on that subject, but had twisted it and had perverted it. And we saw them both listed in 1 Corinthians 8, where Paul talks about the outline of Christian liberty and then talks about, in the same context, the meat offered to idols. We saw that in that context, the weaker brother is not the one who is the obnoxious brother, but the weaker brother is one who is tempted to sin when you do something that violates his conscience and he doesn't tell you, he just does it. The obnoxious brother is the one who screams and yells about it, but he's not a weaker brother because he'd never do it. We saw that in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, Paul talked about the right to marry, the right to get paid, uh, how to witness to Jews and Gentiles, how to earn heavenly rewards, and then in chapter 10 he moved back to talking about Israel's ten acts of rebellion and in that context went back to talking about sacrifices to idols and in the context of the Lord's table. We covered a lot. All right, so tonight, the church at Sardis part two. Clearly, the issue as we're looking at the church at Sardis and on chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians is the issue of separation. I talked about that a little bit this morning. I told you that Jezebel in Thyatira was exposed to Paul's teaching on Christian liberty sex and things offered to idols, but was perverting it for her own end. But we also know that the apostates were twisting the writings of Peter as well, and Paul, Peter says they were twisting Paul's writings as well as his in 2 Peter 3.15. So if you're jotting down references, we'll start here with 2 Peter 3.15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So even though Peter and Paul had a, a spat over in the book of Acts, Peter understands the apostolic authority of Paul as Paul understood the apostolic authority of Peter and called Peter on the carpet about that. But here Peter, after that event, is writing and saying that the writings of Paul are inspired scripture. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that means to twist, as in wrestling, as they do also, now listen to what he says, the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter calls the writings of Paul scripture. And he says that there are some people who've been taking Paul's writings and twisting them to mean something they don't mean, which is precisely what we saw Jezebel doing. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. It's possible for a believer to be seduced into believing false doctrine when it's presented just so. The devil knows where your weaknesses are. He knows where to attack. He knows where you're not wearing the armor. He gets into the chinks in the armor. Instead, he says, the way you avoid that is grow in grace. 
and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Learn more about Jesus because he's your example. He's the one you're supposed to be following. That's good advice for all the churches we've seen so far. Learning to live like Jesus. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. There were two other passages also that were important. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And here we have the things about issues about idols. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the same church that he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to, which was the issue about the meat offered to idols. And he says, don't you understand? You're eating the meat offered to idols in a stone temple, but your body, which is taking the meat in, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's comparing temples. Now, something else that interested me greatly was the church at Thessalonica. Because you can compare the church at Thessalonica with the church at Thyatira. And the church at Thessalonica had many of the same words of praise given to Thessalonica. Praise words that were given also to Thyatira. Remember, Thyatira had ten words of praise. We find those same praises given to Thessalonica, but without the accusations. There was no Jezebel at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. We give thanks to God always for you all. They were Texans, you all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Oh, there we go. Thyatira. Labor of love. There's Thyatira. Patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thyatira. In the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. They understood the doctrine of election. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you, for your sake. Now, it's been posited that the church at Thyatira was an offshoot of Paul's ministry when he went through that area, although we don't have a record of it during his missionary journeys. But Thessalonica, we do have that record, and they knew what Paul was like. And some of the places that the Apostle Paul visited were very close to these seven churches of Asia. Of course, Ephesus was one of them in particular. That was the first church that we looked at. But his ministry swept through that area there. And so these folks would have known, those ones in the seven churches, would have known what Paul's teaching on these subjects was. You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You not only heard our doctrine, you watched our lifestyle. By the way, people do that with you too. They not only hear what you have to say, but they watch your lifestyle. What are you doing? And you became followers of us and of the Lord. See, Paul says, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Like, I could say, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Don't follow the bad stuff that I do because I am a human being. But follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said. And he says that the Thessalonians did this. You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples. Ah, lifestyle. Not merely doctrinally correct, lifestyle. What's your life like? What's your example like? When other believers watch you, especially weaker believers, what do they see? To all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. So we see a lot of parallels here with what was being said positively about Thyatira. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how, ah, suddenly a difference. And how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
they weren't doing any more monkeying around with the idols. No more pussyfooting at the temple of the idols. Why? Because they were looking forward with eagerness and expectancy to something very important and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come, which is the great tribulation. You see, when you focus on living like Jesus, it keeps you from people like Jezebel. Thyatira failed in that, even though it had a lot of good things going for them. Thessalonica succeeded in that. The Apostle John writes over in 1 John chapter 5, speaking of the rapture, speaking of the blessed hope, he says, and every man that hath this hope in him does what? Come on, somebody that must know this. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Thyatira was sort of keeping their eyes on Jesus, but one eye kept wobbling off to the side over to Jezebel. Thessalonica received commendation and no warning of destruction. Thyatira received lots of commendation, but destruction was coming. So that brought us to church number five, to Sardis. Now, if somebody wanted to make a ghoulish horror movie about Sardis, they could name it The Church of the Living Dead, or Religious Zombies from the Past, or This Place Used to Smell Sweet, but Now It Stinks. Sardis was living off the capital of its former glory. They were proud of their spiritual heritage, just like Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. They could still lay claim to spiritual outreach because there were a few names even in Sardis that did not compromise their testimony even as the rest of Sardis fell into worldly carnality to the extent that Pergamos and Thyatira had done. So the carnal believers at Sardis felt content to rest on the laurels of the past and on the labor of the few that the church still had in the present. We talked about that last week. We talked about how Bible Presbyterian Church sounds very familiar, resting on the laurels of our magnificent past while we casually watch the few pull most of the load. That was Sardis in a nutshell. There were a few faithful ones to whom Christ gives praise, verse 4, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So even a grotesquely dead church can still have a faithful remnant like Sardis had. You know, uh, I may have mentioned this last week, but you know, I've driven all over the United States. You know, I make these humongous long drives through Nowheresville. And, and it's amazing to me to see churches, and I've seen many of them named Sardis Baptist church. Now, sometimes I wonder if that was just a, a cynical pastor who had given up on the church and said, hey, let's take a new church name. It's in the Bible. We'll be Sardis Bast Baptist Church. And then he grins to himself and says, they don't know that I'm telling them they're a dead church. You know, I can't imagine giving a name to church like that, looking at its character that we have in Revelation. That's the kind of church that Jesus described when he said in Mark chapter 11, verse 13, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. That's Sardis. You know, it's interesting to notice as we read a comparison between all these churches, there is no persecution mentioned at Sardis. <laughs> you say, hmm, yeah, that's interesting. Well, of course, 
Why would the devil persecute a dead church? He's not going to persecute a dead church. What were the three things that we saw so far that killed the previous churches? Number one, false doctrine. Number two, immorality. Number three, careless and corrupt living. It'll do that here too. It doesn't matter which trigger you pull of those three triggers. All three triggers have a barrel pointed back at your own head. One of the obvious keys to the deadness of Sardis was gold. The Pactolus River flowed near Sardis, and it was filled with gold. Sardis was the capital of the incredibly wealthy and Lydian kingdom. It was at Sardis that gold and silver coins were first minted. They were, as we say, the people of Sardis were stinking rich. But their focus was on gold, not gold tried in the fire. Ah, what a difference. Earthly gold or the gold that's tried in the fire. Speaking of the spiritual gold that we have when we come through the fire with Christ. Sardis was the capital and wealthy. The gold tried in the fire doesn't lead to a bank account. It leads to life everlasting. The most famous king of Sardis was Croesus. Now, I'm sure some of you must have heard of Croesus. That was a filthy rich king who was mentioned by the Pope when he was trying to raise funds to build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome during the Reformation. The archaeologists have been digging around where Sardis used to be, and they've discovered hundreds of melting pots for melting gold in Sardis. Did you know the gold and silver coins were first minted in Sardis? Sardis was about 30 miles from Thyatira on a ridge in the Hermas River Valley. So we're obviously going to see some overlap in the sense of those two cities. They were very close to each other. But there's a difference. Sardis was impregnable. That ridge that stuck out of the valley was 1,500 feet above the valley floor, making the city of Sardis impregnable. The ridge had on three sides very smooth, nearly perpendicular stone walls rising straight up out of the valley floor. You've seen some of these kind of rocks out in the Midwest where these gigantic columns of rock just come pushing up out of the middle of the the desert floor. That's what Sardis was like. But it was only on three sides. They had a, a very circuitous winding path that went up the fourth side so people could get up to the top. But you know that the pride that Sardis felt in their three perpendicular stone sides was also their downfall. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. They thought that those sides were so impossible they didn't even bother to post guards on those three sides. But did you know there were mountain climbers back in those ancient days just like there are people now that can climb to the top of the highest mountains in the world? Because they failed to put guards along those sides, the Persians sent in their best rock climbers by night who scaled the walls undetected and conquered the city. In fact, that city, the city of Sardis, fell twice in the same way. First to Cyrus, king of Persia, and again to Antiochus the Great. Both times, the city was asleep and no watchmen were put on the three sides that the rulers thought were impregnable. That really describes the spiritual condition of Sardis. They were so asleep, Jesus calls them dead. Anybody can walk into the house of a dead man if the dead man is lying there. He won't see him or hear him or watch as they take it. They can steal anything they want. Sardis also made claim to being the first place to produce a semi-permanent wool dye so that they had an economic engine that produced even more money. The people in Sardis were very proud of their fancy, colorful clothing. But did you notice here in the text, Jesus told them that they need white clothing. Remember verses 3 and 4? Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, in white for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. 
not your colorful, fancy, dyed wool garments. White raiment, and I will not blot out his name from the, out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. We talked about the memorial of a name. You know, various research has been done as to what is the thing that people want to hear most in any given language. Is it they want to hear the word love in their language? Or joy or peace? You might think they're up there at the top. Some, do you know what the thing is that people want to hear most in their own language? What they delight in most is when they hear their own name. When they hear their own name. Especially if somebody is praising and using their name. We're all like that. We love to hear our name. We love to see it in lights. Here's Jesus. I will not blot out his name, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Not just before the Father, but imagine Jesus. He's introduced you to the Father and says, this is my beloved son so-and-so, or this is my beloved daughter so-and-so. And the Father says, Welcome home. And then Jesus takes his arm and he turns you like this. And here are the angelic hosts. And he says, all you angels out there, stop talking and singing for just a minute. I want to tell you the name of somebody who's important to me. And he says, this is, put your name in there. Jesus says, I won't blot out his name. I'll put his name, I'll confess his name before my Father and before the holy angels. Do you understand what Sardis was giving up if they did not repent? If they did not turn around? If they did not strengthen the things that remained because almost everything in that church was dead? But there were still a few Strengthen the things that remain. And if you do that, think about the day. We talked about God's name this morning, but think about the day when your name, Jesus will announce you to the Father. Father, I'm coming into your presence, and with me I have Christian Sturgis Spencer. I tremble to even think of it. And then he turns me to the angels. I want to introduce you to one of my redeemed. And the angels pay attention. Christian Sturgis Spencer. Jesus says, if you repent, this is what happens. If you don't repent, this is what you lose. we tend to take the warnings of Jesus to believers far too quickly shove them aside. These are serious warnings, and these are to the believers who were not dead at Sardis to strengthen the things that remain. And if you overcome, you get the white raiment. If you overcome, you'll not get your name blotted out of the book of life. If you overcome, Jesus will confess your name before the Father and before the angels. Clothing is what others see when we walk in their midst. And in the Bible, clothing is the reflection of the character of the person who wears the clothing. Now, God is the one who invented clothing. God designed it as a covering for modesty, not as an enticing way to show off the body. You know, today, if you go anywhere in public, you soon see people with very skimpy clothing designed to show off their tattoos, their erogenous areas, their muscles, their figure, their form. They pay hundreds of dollars for clothing that purposely has holes torn in it by the manufacturer and tie-dyed stains on it. Clothes like that tell you something about the character of the person who's wearing the clothing. Just like you can tell something about a person wearing the uniform of a policeman or a fireman or a soldier. 
The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that in our intermediate body we are told that we will be clothed upon, that we should not be found naked. Our spirit was designed to be in a body. Our bodies clothe our spirits and reflect what is in our spirit. White clothing, as spoken of here, speaks of purity and cleanness. It used to be that doctors and nurses and orderlies always wore white clothing in the operating room, although now they've begun to wear green and blue scrubs. The morally pure bride always wears white at her wedding to portray this. Bakers often wear white clothing and white caps to show customers that they're working in clean premises making unsoiled bread. White clothing. The Bible also uses white garments to speak of moral purity and stained garments to speak of moral impurity. For example, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. He talks about human righteousness and calls it filthy rags. That's actually a much more... Mm, you would say gross term that is used there to describe that. Menstruous cloth is the word that's used. That's what your righteousness is like in the eyes of God. The Bible also tells us that staining is a symbol for the activities of the flesh that pollute us. Jude verse 23 and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now he's not talking about their jackets. He's talking about their bodies. But he calls them their garments spotted by the flesh. White robes appear frequently in the book of Revelation. They're usually seen in relation to the pureness of Christ. But when seen on believers, they speak of us clothed in his purity and righteousness. The holy angels in the book of Revelation are also portrayed in white robes of holy righteousness and moral purity. If you're taking notes, I'll give you a few of the references here. I'm not going to read them all because our time is flying by. But Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. Chapter 7, verse 9. We see the white garments all over the book of Revelation. Chapter 7, verse 13. Chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Chapter 19, verse 14. Jesus uses it the same way in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. Mark chapter 9, verse 3. Matthew chapter 28, verse 3. Mark chapter 16, verse 5. We see even at the ascension, it says, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. How did he go into heaven? Clothed in white. Who was standing with him? The two men in white apparel were, the, were angels. He's going to be coming back clothed in white, but his white vesture is dipped in blood. And he's coming back. And we're riding on horses with him in Revelation chapter 19, clothed in white raiment, clean and white. And it says the white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. It's a picture that the Bible uses all over the place, both Old Testament and New Testament. Something else you may find of interest. The Sardis also appears to be the home city of Aesop, who wrote many of the Greek fables. You've read Aesop's fables? Well, that means that Sardis was also a city of literary genius as well as a city of wealth, a city of fancy clothing. They had everything. In other words, they had it all, but having it all had made them think that they were self-sufficient. Jesus says that in reality they were stinking dead. In 17 AD, Sardis was again destroyed by an earthquake, but the Romans wanted to rebuild it. In fact, it was rebuilt by a financial grant from Emperor Tiberius because this was an economic powerhouse that Rome did not want to lose. But the church was there too. And the sad thing about the church at Sardis was that gold and the economy, I don't know how many of you remember hearing this, but going through different presidential elections, I heard this phrase so many times, it's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. No, for the believer, it's not the economy. For the believer, it's faithfulness to Christ and moral purity. 
It's walking in white. It's being among the few. The few who have not caved in to what the world focuses on, its gold and its fancy clothes and its literary skills and all of its talent and all of its abilities and all of the stuff. And Sardis had it all. But the church had bought into it and the church was dead. How often does that happen today when Christians have to follow the stock market with a passion that in some cases rivals drug addiction? You see, when we take our eyes off Jesus and glue them to money, we become like Sardis, the night of the walking dead. I think it's interesting to notice that Jesus chooses not to give any compliments to Sardis at the beginning of his letter. He did that at the beginning of all the other letters. That's the standard format of all the other letters. But with Sardis, he doesn't do that. Instead, he starts right off with his rebuke. You see, spiritual deadness is a serious issue with Christ. And because it is, and because this letter is written not just to Sardis, but let the churches hear what the Spirit is saying to them. It's to all of us. It's to this church. We need to sit up and take warning. You see, Jesus sees through the sham religious front. He looks at the heart where he finds the unrepentant sin. And then he causes us to stare at it as well as he staring at it so that we will repent, so that we'll confess our sins, so that we'll turn around, so that we'll actively follow Christ. As Sardis, we also have another illustration of what I call the remnant principle. I know there are many people who've called it that. There were a few. There was a remnant at Sardis who did not follow the wealthy sloth of the majority. Most of the American church could fall into Sardis because, of course, we're so rich here compared to the rest of the world, it's not even funny. But Jesus singles out the remnant for special praise. That's also in verse 3 and 4. Thou hast a few names, a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The remnant principle is frequently seen in the Bible. God may let the rest of the culture slide, but he always keeps a few of his elect living holy lives as an example, even in the midst of a corrupt society. Noah and his family are an illustration of this. Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham is another illustration of the remnant principle. Joseph in Egypt is another illustration of an isolated, truly isolated faithful man who had every rational motive for compromise, but he refused. He understood the purposes of God. You see, God always keeps a faithful remnant alive, even in times of greatest worldliness, even in times of greatest compromise and apostasy and internal rot in the church. So that brings us to a question. We have to ask this of ourselves. Are you one of the faithful remnant and not merely thinking that you are part of the remnant? We all want to think that we're part of the remnant. But on careful examination, Are you part of the remnant, or do you just think you're part of the remnant? You all know people who think they're on their way to heaven, that they're saved, that they've never done anything really bad, so God's going to have to let them in. As I stand up here in the pulpit, I can think of half a dozen people right off the bat that think they're saved, and they're not. But if you talk to them, they will tell you, yes, they're going to heaven, and they will argue with you. And they will not admit that they are sinners. They're good, they say. And God's going to have to let them in because they're so good. And they're outright pagans. Uh Uh-huh. I'm not going to tell you who, but they don't live far from here. And I see them frequently. Paul gives an articulate statement on the theology of the remnant principle in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. 
Paul writes and he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Lord, I'm the only one left. I mean, how, how far down does this have to go? And I'm running away right now. Jezebel's out to get me. She's got her hatchet out there, and she's been chopping people up. How did God answer? Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. It certainly hasn't gotten as bad for us as it did for Elijah as he was running away from Jezebel. And when he complained to God and he says, Lord, you know, we're really few and far between. <laughs> I, I think I'm the only one left. Everybody I know that was, was a prophet, uh, everybody I know that was a believer in you, everybody I know that used to worship you, they're dead. God says to him, Elijah, quit sweating it. You don't know who they are, but I have precisely 7,000 men not 7,000 little kids, not 7,000 little retards, not 7,000 women who are hiding out someplace overseas. I have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so at this present time, God always saves out in a remnant according to the election of grace. Sometimes the remnant, as in Elijah's day, is larger than we think, since it's, the remnant is often disconnected by distance and time. But the remnant is there. The tares may outnumber the wheat, but God makes sure that there is some wheat at the time of harvest. At the time of the Reformation, the Roman Catholic institution was filthy rich and just as decadent as Sardis. But God had kept a remnant alive. And these living seed broke free and became the spiritual ancestors of this church. But you know, the pull, the attraction of Sardis is always there. Even a church like this one can quickly slide back into the grave of the living dead, only to poke its head out occasionally at midnight and give a garish grin. But Jesus gives his commandments to the faithful remnant. He doesn't give these commands here to the dead church, the, the church of the people who think we think we are saved hypocrites. But he gives five commands which are to the living ones because they're supposed to strengthen the things that they still have. Command number one is wake up. You gotta know what's going on around you. You're getting sleepy. The hypnotist is there. The Sardis gold is there. The fancy clothes of Sardis is there. The political power is there. The security of your fortress is there. You're getting sleepy. You're getting sleepy. You're getting sleepy. So his first command is wake up. Wake up. Don't let the apathy of the rest of the church lull you into the sleep of death. Second command. Strengthen the things that remain. In other words, the fire is going out. Pay attention. You need to put more wood on the fire. You need to fan the flames to make the fire brighter and brighter and brighter in that scary, dark night of the jungle. Strengthen the things that remain. Third command. Remember. Remember. That's a call to go back what they already knew. That's a call to go back to the things that they had already seen and heard. Next command is keep. 
keep. In other words, faithfully obey what you know and remember. Fifth command. And this is the one that I find fascinating. Because remember, this is written to the people who had hung in there that were still believers, who hadn't made the compromises, who weren't dead, the ones who were still alive but ready to die, but they were still alive. Fifth command, repent. You say, now wait a minute, we're the good guys. Isn't it those bad guys, the guys who are the dead guys that need to repent? The command is given to the faithful few who remain. He tells them, repent. Because you see, there is no revival without repentance. Without God's people falling on their faces and crying out to God. And people, we need that in this church. This is a church that is about to die. I am blunt. Repent. There's no revival without repentance. You know, it does no good to point to other people who are dead and say, they need to stop being dead. Hmm. The call to repentance was given to the remnant, to those ones who are still alive. And you know that, that it's true here at Collingswood. Those who are alive are the ones who need to repent. There's probably no hope for those who have completely been put into the pit of spiritual death and decay. When the remnant in any church puts these five principles into practice, the few can bring revival to the church. And dear friends, we need revival here. Do you see yourself as part of the remnant? If you do, then you need to do five things. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain. Remember, keep, and repent. It doesn't do any good to gripe about the people who never do anything. That only makes you stubbornly follow their example and also do nothing because you don't want them to, to benefit them by doing stuff and then they're benefiting. Instead, be one of the few that bring revival. But, but we say, if that happens, the lazy dead sloths will get the benefit and they'll take the credit. There are two words that I learned from a law school professor, Professor Alex Bola. We had him for contract class, and we would come up with all these grand ideas as we were answering his question, and he would always ask, so what? Or, who cares? In other words, you still haven't gotten to the point. So what? Who cares? if the lazy dead sloths get the benefit, if the lazy dead sloths get the credit. Many years ago, my father taught me something that has stuck with me all these years. He said to me, Christian, you can get a lot accomplished in ministry if you don't care who gets the credit. You can get a lot accomplished in ministry if you don't care who gets the credit. Because there are always people out there who are credit suckers. They're always... <laughs> trying to get, suck up the credit for everything that gets done. They want to stand in the limelight and have everybody ooh and awe about what everybody thinks they did, but they didn't do it. You know, it's true. It doesn't matter. God knows who did the work, and God is the one who ultimately gives the heavenly rewards, which is what really counts. On the other side of the coin, it's a whole lot easier just to sit and do nothing. So let me step on some toes here. For example, I've been around here for more than 10 years. I've noticed that there are some ladies here who like to boss other people around, but they never do any of the work. The first place I noticed that was in the kitchen. One lady I know of in particular likes to tell people what they can and can't do in the kitchen and has made statements as, we don't do it that way, to eager volunteers who are doing the work. But I've also noticed that particular lady of whom I speak never brings any food to the church dinners. She never helps set up. She definitely never helps clean up. And yet she enjoys being critical of others who are actually doing the work. She eats and walks out. That discourages those who are actually participating in the work. May I say it? Shades of Sardis. Jesus tells Sardis, those who are the remnant, don't let that kind of stuff discourage you. 
Those guys are already dead. But now here's the warning. It's a warning given to the living remnant at Sardis. Sardis. Jesus tells the living remnant, if they fail to follow the five steps for revival, Jesus said he would come on them as a thief in the night. You know, in the Bible, the thief in the night picture is always used to speak of impending judgment. We're past time, but I'll give you some of the references just so you can write them down and look them up on your own. Matthew 24, verse 43. Luke chapter 12. Verse 39. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. They all have the thief in the night motif, and it's always related to judgment. And that's what Jesus says to the church at Sardis, to the remnant, the ones who are listening to him. He tells them what they need to do, and if they don't do it, judgment is coming. Judge Jesus makes it clear that he will destroy all dead churches where there is no revival. All dead churches where there is no revival. The living are the ones who need to bring about revival through their repentance through the five things that are mentioned here in the text. Hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let me just mention in passing here, it talks about blotting out a person's name out of the book of life. That's a reference to the sin unto death. God kills Christians who refuse to do what they are told to do. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So what do we have here for the exhortation of Jesus? Quit playing church. Do what is necessary for revival. May we hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the warning. It pulled no punches, the warning that you gave to Sardis. And it wasn't just for Sardis alone. They're very much like the modern American church, very much like us here at Bible Presbyterian Church. A name they lived and were dead. The night of the walking dead. Oh Lord, that it might not be true of us, but that your faithful remnant here, that we would fall on our faces and repent of our sins and call on you to restore this church. Thank you, Father, for your word. Apply it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.